Well, thanks everybody for, for having us, and, and Happy New Year. I'm not sure how long you can actually say Happy New Year before it starts becoming overused, but I, I've got to believe that Monday, January 6th, we're still okay. Um, with me today is Joshua Brost. Uh, our uh, PR expert lives here in San Francisco. I actually, as you can probably tell from the accent, uh, am not from here. I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I left 10 degrees in snow yesterday, so this is awesome. I may just hang around here for a while and hit that happy hour. So. Uh, again, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, you know, it's, uh, James asked us to, to come out and, and speak to you all about just kind of what we're seeing, that kind of thing. And I thought about the new year. You know, we say happy new year. And the new year always brings what? Kind of a, kind of a rebirth, right? Kind of, you know, a, a, you know, a chance for a, a clean slate, a new start, that kind of thing. And certainly, overall, a strong sense of optimism, about what the new year can bring. And hopefully today, uh, we will bring that message to all of you uh, for 2014 uh, and beyond. James wanted me to speak uh, about three things today, really talking about the overall IT labor market landscape, kind of what we're seeing out there. Uh, certainly moving into 2014 and beyond, what we forecast, what we predict, that kind of thing. And then certainly as we go through all this, maybe some recommendations for all of you and certainly for your students as well. So to kick things off, wow, what a great year in 2013. And not just 2013, it's been a good ride now in IT for probably the last three years or so. Depends on what part of the country you're from, I get that. Uh, it's kind of odd, though. You think about the national economy. You know, if someone came to the United States from another country and saw what was going on, they'd kind of say, well, you know, there's some pockets of success, and, and yeah, the unemployment rate is kind of shrinking a little bit, and, and there's a little bit of positive signs. But we're not seeing that at all in IT. It has been gangbusters for the past three years plus. And we see no, no end in sight. And you all, I should really give a, a big thank you uh, to kick things off to all of you for helping uh, supply the IT talent that we so desperately need out there you know, for our clients. I mean, at Robert Half, all we do is supply uh, individuals to our, to our clients, whether it be in accounting, finance, whether it be legal, uh, creative and marketing, office administration, and certainly in information technology where Joshua and I specialize. Uh, there's just such a strong demand out there. We've set, as my boss is famous for saying, we can look clients directly in the eye and say, business has never been better. And that is not a spin, that is not a marketing claim, that is absolute fact. We have had more demand for our people than ever before, setting records all across the US and Canada. And of course, it's not just us, it's our competitors as well. There's just such great demand out there. You know, where will it go in 2014? We'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, certainly we're very optimistic about the future and you all, and, and certainly your students should be very optimistic about careers in IT as well. And I'm gonna make sure I've got this clicker going. Okay. so. You look at this slide, and by the way, I'm not going to kill you all with PowerPoint slides. I only have a few, just kind of as a as some some of you are kind of uh, sigh of relief there. So uh, we'll be we'll be fairly short with that. But you look at it, 83 percent of CIOs say they plan to hire technology staff in the first half of, of 2014. You know, and in a way I'm surprised it's not 100% because I mean, everywhere we go, it's just demand. I need more people, I need more people. I can't, I can't build this app, I can't build this application, I can't do what I, I can't grow the way I wanna grow uh, without talent. And of course we're seeing uh, not just in, in the direct hire world, but also in the contract world. We place a lot of individuals on a you know, short-term, long-term contract, project-type basis as well. So all of that goes into an overall huge demand. Now, do all of these people need two-year degrees? Do they all need you know, certifications? Do they need four-year degrees? Well, what I always tell people is, you can't have enough education. I've never had one client come to me and say, John, you know this candidate you have? Just way too much education. 
I mean, it just doesn't happen, right? I mean, I don't know, maybe some, you know, PhD or person at some point, but I mean, for the most part, no one ever says that. So more education is always better. Uh, certainly, though, there are individuals that I know you all are coaching and, and teaching that may not want to go into a four-year degree program, and that's fine. We're seeing a ton of opportunity um, for people with, with two-year degrees, even a ton of opportunity for people um, with, with just some college or maybe a certification, that kind of thing. So you know, in the short amount of time we have, there's so many different roads we could go down with this topic, but just in general, there's a lot of opportunity to go around everywhere. Now, here's the thing, though. This great economy is not without challenges. I mean, you look at this stat. I remember when I was in college, and that's been a few years, but my economics professors would tell me that, you know what, if we could get to 5% unemployment, that would be full employment, right? We're talking about, in our sector, less than 3%. In some positions, it's less than 1%. It almost becomes a meaningless statistic at some point as far as the unemployment rate. Yeah, and this is actually, you know, one of the reasons why we're having such uh, you know, difficulty, uh, you know, finding people. And you think about it, 63%, and again, I'm surprised it's not 100, but almost two-thirds of CIOs say finding technology talent is challenging, okay? Every single person I talk to. Every client I talk to says it's challenging to find IT talent. Certainly that unemployment rate is one aspect, right? The best people are working, okay? Well, so what are some other reasons why there's such a challenge? Think about the pace of innovation. Think about what's going on out there. What was, what was new one, two, three years ago is now what? Either obsolete or maybe kind of on its way out. I was thinking about it on the way over here. Everybody has one of these silly things, right? I remember not too long ago, this used to be a telephone, right? What is it now? It's everything else. Do you ever read the comparisons of, of, of like an iPhone or HTC or you know, whatever your phone is? Do they ever talk about the phone capability, right? It's all about apps or the camera and what it'll do and all the trick shots it'll do and all this stuff, right? I mean, just the pace of innovation is unbelievable. So that's another reason why there's such a shortage of talent. And again, one of the reasons why we should thank all of you every day for, for keeping people up with, um, with current technology, okay? Uh, certainly another reason for the, the shortage, if you will, of talent uh, is, is, is more like a perceived shortage. The Great Recession, if you will, of 08, 09, certainly into 10, had kind of an odd benefit to companies. They could be very picky about the people that they were trying to attract. You know, they want everything, right? They, they want everything under the sun, all the current technology, all the business skills, all the communication skills, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about that in a little bit, right? And oh, by the way, they could set the price, right? An employer-driven market. Well, guess what? We got past that. We got into 2011, 2012, obviously last year. Became very much an employee-driven market, all right? So this, this talent wasn't quite as available as, uh, as people that before they got spoiled with that time and being able to put things off. Um, but I would submit, though, that you know, going back to education and, and where all of you all fit, we're finding that a lot of middle and, and high school programs have just de-emphasized uh, technology and computer science in their programs. In fact, um, I've got some stats here, not to bore you with a lot of information, but according to uh, this um, computer science education advocate, Computing in the Core, uh, introductory secondary school computer science courses have decreased in number by 17% since 2005. The number of advanced placement computer science courses has decreased by one-third. And the College Board reports that here in the state of California, I mean, home of obviously the most innovative and, and highly influential tech companies in the world, less than 1% of all AP exams taken in 2011 were in computer science. 
So again, you look at kind of that foundation from kind of the middle and high school level, and I'm sure you're all finding that you've got to play catch up sometimes with a lot of these folks to get them prepared for, uh, for IT careers. You know, and again, you know, not everybody, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, not every company uh, or not every individual needs a four-year degree or a two-year degree or even a certification, but again, more education is certainly uh, is certainly better. Uh, certainly some companies, some of our clients are absolutely sticking to their guns on, on education. It's almost comical because we'll have a client and they'll say, well, John, you know, got to have a four-year degree. And, I, and of course, you know, what, what am I going to say, right? Well, the computer science, math, you know, that kind of thing. No, nah, not nah, just a four-year degree. Okay, so you're telling me that if, I, if I've got this .NET professional here that, that has the skills you're looking for and, and they don't have a degree, you don't want them, right? Well, that's right. And you're also telling me if I've got this .NET professional that has everything you want and they've got an art history degree, you'd take them. Yeah, that's right. Okay, maybe, maybe, we get a, maybe we've got an issue there with that, with that company. But for the most part, that's kind of the exception. You do run into that a little bit, but for the most part, people are wanting skills. Uh, yes, four-year degrees. Certainly when you get into uh, people on a management track and that kind of thing. Um, but, but for the most part, you know, we're talking to James on the phone before this, before this conversation. You know, not... Uh, not everybody needs, uh, needs the education. You know, again, we always encourage more education, but there's a lot of people out there that don't want to jump through all the hoops, that kind of thing, and, and go to that four-year degree. Lots of times a two-year degree is perfect, and it really jump starts a career or jump starts a, a second career. So how long does this lack of talent, if you will, last? Well, we, we see no end in sight on this. We're looking at 4.2 million computing jobs in IT by 2020. Now, you know, again, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't have any idea if, uh, you know, there's always things that can happen, that kind of thing. But in general, we're seeing that for the next six, seven years, your students essentially have the pick of jobs provided they have the right skills. And when we talk about the right skills, we're not just talking about technology. We're gonna talk about soft skills here in a little bit, business skills, that kind of thing. You know, people, you know, our clients are asking for much more of a well-rounded individual, not just technology skills, all right? Uh, you know, in preparation for this discussion, we, uh, we asked, you know, our field, uh, professionals, you know, kind of what clients are seeing is, or what they're wanting, what's considered the best when we, um, when we're looking for individuals and looking for talent. Well, this is, this is all clients want, just all of that, right? Okay, good luck, I know. So certainly, if they can get it, as much computer science as possible, certainly as much math as possible. Again, that's, that's, that's kind of a given. Uh, certainly not required, but again, as much of that as possible. But beyond that, you look at what else is up there, okay? Again, going back to this idea of someone being well-rounded, you know, kind of lib liberal arts courses, right? Uh, certainly someone that can um, not necessarily be a public speaker and give presentations, but someone very, you know, you know strong verbal communications, certainly someone strong in, in written communications. Um, you know, certainly we get into this whole idea of, of, of critical thinking and problem solving, that kind of thing. I know that whenever we talk to uh, clients, we're looking to place an individual, so often clients They'll ask, in the interview, they'll ask certainly technical questions, but so often they're really just looking for how the person thinks and, and what's their thought process. What, they, they don't even really care for the answer to the question many times. They want to know how this person attacks a problem, right? Uh, certainly, our clients are looking for how well our uh, candidates and the IT professionals that we place work in a team and how well they collaborate with each other, okay? 
Uh, certainly business courses, and I can't emphasize this enough. Now, this doesn't mean that we need to make everybody, you know, some sort of a, a you know, MBA or that kind of thing. But as much as you can, get your students to talk the language of business, okay? Everything that you read, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but everything you read, everything you hear, I mean, companies are willing to spend money on new apps, new applications, whatever it may be, right? Anything to get an edge on their competition using information technology. So we all get that, right? However, everything has to have a payback, right? And the more that your students can get in their head this idea of everything has to have a return on investment component. So in some way, what they're doing has to affect an increase in revenue, a decrease in expenses, or somehow improving operational efficiencies. Okay? And this is something, advice for students, that you can take and, 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 and give them just, just good coaching there's something that, that we came up with a while back, especially for, for people in, in interview situations. Uh, it's a little acronym we came up with called GRRR, G-R-R, and it's along those same lines of ROI. So any project they've ever been a part of, have them articulate to the interviewer or whoever they're talking to the goal of that project, okay, their particular role in that project and the result of that project. I know it's a very simple acronym, it's easy to remember, but if people can kind of keep that straight, it, it really helps these IT people because, you know, as we all know, sometimes they can kind of stray and get down and tell you how the watch was made and all that kind of thing. It keeps everything sort of short to the point. Here's what I worked on. Here was, here was the, the, the overall project. Here was my role in this, and here's, here was the, the business outcome. Okay, so I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, also, too, you know, this, going back to this idea of of communication skills, that kind of thing. Uh, that that, that kind of comes under the big umbrella of soft skills. I'm gonna give you all a little tip here. We place thousands of individuals you know, all over the country, all over Canada. Uh, I would love to tell you we bat a thousand, we don't. Occasionally a client will say, you know what, John, gosh, you just missed the mark on Jane Doe. We're sending her back to you, you know, really can't use her. Rarely, Rarely do we get someone sent back to us because of a technical issue. Generally, overwhelmingly, it's something that falls under that soft skill category. Whether it's a lack of communication skills or, or anything else that falls, they, they can't take direction well. They, um, you know, they don't work in a team well. They take two-hour lunches. They're surfing the internet when they shouldn't be. I mean, you know, fill in the blank, right? All of that comes under soft skills. And here's the other thing that I've learned. A lot of you will sit here, most of you will sit here and go, well, gosh, that's common sense. People should know that kind of thing. They should know that if, you know, work starts at 8 o'clock, guess what? Be there at or before 8. I was in an office recently. One of our people we just hired, great young guy, really smart, had his own, uh, his own internet company, sold it, very talented, joined us as a recruiter. First couple of days with us, he waltzes in about 9 o'clock. Now, we officially start at 8, but everybody's usually there by 7.30, certainly 7.45 at the latest. He comes waltzing in about 9 o'clock. People are just that they can't believe it. And they're already against this poor guy. You know, we hate him and he's going to be terrible and da-da-da. Nobody actually told him to be there by 8. And again, you think, well, gosh, you, you got to have some common sense. But the, the, the people that we're placing sometimes have so much talent and, and they're so gifted, but they don't necessarily know these things. And it's important that you all, as coaches and mentors, kind of help them with some of kind of the, 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 the ways of the world, if you will, not just the technical skills. Again, nobody, nobody calls us and says, John, you know, Jane Doe just didn't have enough Active Directory. 
you know, uh, Jim Johnson, just, just his store procedures, yeah, just not good enough. And we just don't hear that. It's always something that comes under this whole idea of, of soft skills. Right? Moving on. Oh, my goodness. We could talk about this for a couple hours. I promise we won't. But industry certifications uh, generate a lot of discussion. And there's a lot, there's a lot of kind of, there's, there's two different camps on this. So, some people would tell you that, oh, my gosh, absolutely necessary. you got to have them. Some would say, oh, they're just you know, pieces of paper, that kind of thing. In general, what we hear is, again, like I mentioned earlier, more is better. All other things being equal, get the certification. Right? The trick here is it needs to come with work experience. And a lot of you say, well, gosh, John, they don't really have work experience. We're going to get to that here in a second. But as much experience as they can talk about, the better. Certainly if they're in an interview and they're talking to someone that doesn't put a lot of weight in certifications, guess what? Common sense should kick in. They don't necessarily tout the certification so much, right? They talk about their hands-on knowledge or, or whatever. Certainly there's a whole other camp out there that I mean you absolutely, it's like jacks are better to open. He doesn't get that in my, my, my little phrase. Um, jacks are better to open, got to have the certification. Okay, so, you know, again, there's, there's different schools of thought on this. Again, it goes back to what I said earlier, though. More education certainly is better. Uh, sometimes certifications can work against you, certainly if they're not current. You know, we'll talk to someone and, oh, yeah, I got my MCSE, you know, back in 2005. Well, okay, that's great, but that was a long time ago, right? Are you Because So it can actually hurt you sometimes if you're not if you're not current. I would say in general though, the point that I want to make on certification and, and the coaching for your students is it's, it's more important to convey to a prospective employer that as an IT professional, I have a dedication to lifelong learning. It's not so much about the actual certificate. It's even, even if I already have a certificate, that's fine. I'm still doing this and this and this and whatever it is every day to make myself better so that, so that I don't become irrelevant, obsolete, that kind of thing. I want to stay on top of technology. So that's the main point. We, see it, we hear that all the time from our clients. You know, great that you got this latest Cisco certification. You got your CCNA, whatever it is, and that's fine. But, but, but what, what else are you doing, right? How are you continuing your education? Okay, so moving along, I think, are we doing okay on time, Josh? I know, I know less is always more. I don't want to go, I won't go over. But, um, you know, talking about more recommendations uh, for, for you all as educators, you know, this idea of the specialist economy, you know, we publish a lot of research and, you know, we found that uh, certainly the greatest demand for specialized workers is in IT. That's not surprising. You know, what's, uh, what's interesting is how things have evolved. I know years ago, going back to, the, like, say, for example, the dot-com boom, you know, it was almost enough to say, hey, Mr. Klein, I've got a Java developer. She's available. Right? Now, if I said that to a client, you know what they'd say? So, I got a lot of those people. They really don't, right? But I mean, they'll say that, okay? What are, what, are they, what are they wanting? Well, how much database do they have? What have they built? What have they done with that? Again, it goes back to ROI, right? You know, you gotta, we always want to convey to our, to our, uh, our candidates that we place that, you know, in any coaching that we do with students, you know, it's all about this IT ecosystem. Everything plays off of something else, another department. Now, do they, do, does the developer have to also be a software engineer and also have to be a project manager? Of course not, right? But I would say this, you look at developers, for example, the more that developers can have kind of that project management mindset, the better off they're gonna be. When I talk to our marketing people and our recruiters, and I'm coaching them on talking to a client about a project. I say the most important question you can ask them is not what current version of this software and all this kind of stuff, right? 
what is the client wanting to accomplish? What is the end result business outcome? We hear from our consultants all the time, and that's the feedback we get. It's like, John, we, we understand that you all, as, as IT recruiters, can't possibly understand the intricacies of every program, every app, et cetera, right? But if you'll just tell us specifically what the client is wanting to accomplish, we'll have a much better idea of what specific toolkit to use in solving their business problem, okay? So that's kind of the, the, the way we like to describe it as we're coaching our, our candidates, you know, you, you've got a developer, how much database do you have, right? Again, you know, do you have that project management mindset? Do you have kind of the big picture, you know, in mind? I remember years ago, we talked to a consultant on billing, and I'd say, well, well, what are you working on? Well, I'm working on database. Well, okay, so, you know, what, what's this project all about? Well, I'm doing these tables, and I'm doing this, and writing story procedures, and all that. Okay, so, but, but, but what's the big picture? What's the client wanting to do with this data? How are they using this data to get an edge on their competition? And they just kind of look at you like, well, that wasn't part of the deal. That wasn't part of the description. That wasn't part of the discussion, right? And again, it's amazing how things have evolved. Now, if you get someone that answers kind of like that, let, let, let's, let's get somebody else in here. I need someone more business oriented that understands the big picture, has a vision, that kind of thing, okay? 10 minutes, all right. Uh, okay, so real world experience. Now this one also generates a lot of, a lot of conversation because it's kind of like, well, John, no, wait a second. We're, we're, we've got these people in, in a two year degree program and they don't necessarily have real world experience, right? It's kind of like the chicken and the egg, right? I, I need experience. Well, how do you get experience? Well, you get a job. Well, how do you get a job? Well, you need experience. I mean, you get, you get the idea, right? And, and certainly, we understand that, that a lot of your students don't have an 8 to 5, 40 hour a week necessarily background in, you know, networking, infrastructure development, database, whatever it may be. However, are there some things that they can, that they can do? Are there some things they can put together to help them um, uh, get this experience. Uh, the first thing that we hear from clients all the time is have they done any internships? Uh, that's, a, that's a big thing right now, whether it's paid or unpaid. Now obviously clients love to have uh, your students do unpaid work for them, right? I mean, who doesn't, okay? But uh, it doesn't always have to be that. But anything they can do from an internship standpoint, something that really stands out, that's the other thing too, you know, advice, you know, coaching for your, for your students. This whole idea of, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a network administrator candidate. I've gone two years to community college. I got my CCNA. So here, here I go. H how do you like me now, right? Well, you got to think in terms of, it's what I call the so what test. Imagine the client on the other side of that desk kind of folding their arms and kind of going, so what? Two-year degree, CCNA, I got a thousand of those people. What, what separates you from others that have similar backgrounds? And an internship can be a big uh, kind of point of differentiation. I know myself, uh, years ago, I had an opportunity for an internship at Walt Disney World in Orlando. And I wanted to go to work for IBM. You say, well, gosh, what, what, is, what does Walt Disney World have to do with, with IBM? It's interesting, the recruiter, the, the, the sales manager that, that found my resume uh, liked the fact that I had Walt Disney World training in my background, that, that customer service kind of aspect fit in well with the IT aspect of IBM, and that was several years ago. So again, anything that your people can do to stand out from an internship standpoint, and, and certainly sometimes as well, those internships can, can be what? Can be a, a bridge to full-time employment when they finish school as well. So I can't under, uh, underscore that enough. Uh, certainly, uh, certification classes, uh, you, know, join, you know, being a, in the computer lab, 
at um, you know here at the school, that kind of thing. Uh, certainly, maybe running a, a home lab, uh, joining some type of you know community, that kind of thing. You look at. Um, the open source with this, you know, GitHub, something like that. I mean, very, very popular. Again, you say, well, that's not real world work experience. But again, it's, it's something that someone can put on a resume that can separate them from the pack, so to speak. And I know I'll just, just kind of wrapping up here. I know that um, you look at, at online, and my goodness, everything's online today. You look at you know, Ruby on Rails for Beginners, Code Academy, Stack Overflow, on and on. There's so much out there, all for free. And again, anything like that could be something that someone, a prospective employer, could say, okay, we, we, you've got the core classes, you've got this and that, but you've also got these other, whether it's internship, online, Code Academy, whatever it may be, something that you can point to and say, in place of real world work experience, that's that's pretty close, okay? Uh, finally, just kind of wrapping things up, and again, you know, in a short amount of time, we can't really wrap up everything. We could spend half a day talking about the IT labor markets, what's in demand, that kind of thing. Um, certainly on the infrastructure side, I would definitely say certifications, uh, if not a must, are, are close to being a must nowadays. We don't get it as much in the development space. Uh, we are seeing more on the, the certified database administrators. That's creeping up more and more. Um, but again, you know, encourage your students. You know, more learning is always better. When in doubt, get the certification. Again, if you're in front of someone that doesn't put as much focus on that, then fine. Then you don't you don't tout it as much, right? But certainly on the infrastructure side, we're seeing a good, at least a third of hiring managers saying it's kind of a must have. And then uh, you look at other, you know, uh, sometimes the, the, the certification can be the way to you know, an entry level job, not necessarily, certainly with, with project management. If anyone's going into the project management space, you know, the PMP certification is so popular. If it's a non-technical uh, project manager, PMP is an absolute must. Now, if it's more of a technical project manager, it's not necessarily a requirement, but you get into some of those kind of things and, and uh, certainly we can help you with, with some of that and what we're seeing as well. I know we don't have time to go over everything. Uh, certainly if you're getting into software engineering, especially if you're looking at that to get into a, uh, a management role, that kind of thing, certainly the two year followed by the, the four year degree is, is definitely favorable. All right, kind of coming full circle. Again, I'll start where I, uh, or I'll finish where I started. Uh, there's a there's high expectations out there right there's great demand for the people that you are are churning out of your community colleges uh, and we expect that demand to increase fierce competition no doubt about it but you all again thank you for providing and fueling this um, this inventory, if you will, of future IT professionals, whether it's a you know, first uh, career or even a, a, a second career. So we really appreciate it. That's really all of my comments. Uh, I guess we can take some questions. Shorter is always better, right, James? So I think I finished below time. The other mic. fit for community college students? You know, um, we do a lot of work with HDI. You, I know you're all familiar with that, you know, formerly Help Desk Institute. Certainly they have their own programs, their, you know, customer service search, that kind of thing. Uh, beyond that, certainly, uh, even though it tends to be more of a desktop certification, certainly an A-plus certification, you know, always helps. Again, usually those people do end up moving from the help desk into more of a desk side type role, but I would say anything along those lines is very helpful. But certainly start with the, the HDI, the customer service cert. And then, oh. So I'm, I'm Beth Cataldo and I work with a lot of uh, web students. And one of the main questions 
we have is like how to stay on top of the really fast changing Python, Ruby, the ones that change really quickly. Do you have any way to kind of see what's coming down the pike to tell students or us to create curriculum? You, you know, it's just a constantly moving target. Joshua, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but you know, we just tell people just just stay involved in uh, you know whether you know user groups. I mean, if if your students are not involved in some type of a user group, that's probably the best way to stay plugged in to to current trends, what's going on, that kind of thing. Because again, what's hot today may not be hot tomorrow, that kind of thing. Now you look at like. Uh, and, and again, not to, I'm not making this a commercial for Microsoft, but you look at .NET, obviously it's been popular for a long time, but there's certain other apps, certainly a lot of open source apps that you know kind of come up and go off the radar very quickly. I would say, again, as much as your people can be plugged into you, the user group community, uh, that would probably be more helpful than anything. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Well, I was wondering if I, I, I would love to have that magic pixie dust <laughs> you know a crystal ball that could tell you what's going to be hot and it's uh, we really don't have that hi john i was wondering if hackathons are of any value to a student during an interview from a work experience standpoint if, if and say that again hackathons hackathons yeah i'm not real familiar with 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 hackathons. i mean obviously i've heard of those i mean you know i, I look at it like this anything that you think that you're stu that, that could separate that person from the pack, right? That, that would jump out on a resume, that would jump out in a conversation, right? I think is a good thing, right? Anything, any point of uniqueness, right? Because again, you know, companies are still, even in an employee-driven market, these clients that we deal with are still ridiculously picky, right? And they'll just kind of look at you and go, oh, tell me something else. Yeah, so what? So this guy has this or this or this, what, you know? And who knows, maybe hackathon is something that strikes a nerve with that individual. You know, you never know. So, uh, you know, the more points of uniqueness, I think the better. Okay, thank you, John. That was absolutely wonderful. And here's a little token of our appreciation. Geeks love gizmos. <laughs>